The readers uh, that we'll be privileged to hear from in the next little while include several, some of our own. Susan Howe, who is a professor in the English department, is the author of two collections, Stone, Spirits, and Salt, um, and Lance Larson, who is in and out of that door over there, is the author of four books of poetry. Four, there he is. He went out that way and came in this way. He's the author of four collections of poetry, most recently, Genius Loki. And he is also, can I say this, the Poet Laureate of Utah. Um, Heather Dubrow, from whom you've already heard today, has, has written a book of poems, and she's going to read us a devotional lyric also. Jay Hopler has some that he's going to read to us, and Meg Day, who is a PhD student at the University of Utah, her book Last Psalm at Sea Level is just out um, with Barrow Street Press. So she received a phone call from me yesterday morning at, at 8 o'clock in which I said, what are you doing tomorrow for? And she thought somebody had been killed. So um, that's all I'm going to say. I'd just like to go through uh, those poets and thank each of them for giving us the giving their voices into this conversation. So we'll go Susan, let's see, Susan, Heather, Jay, Lance, Meg. Does it you like that? Let's do that. What poet did you ever have to convince to read their poetry? <laughs> Um, one thing I discovered, this was a great uh, exercise for me because I found that I don't really address God. I don't, I don't like pray or praise, but I try to speak in the voice of God in the occasional <laughs> poem. And I have a lot of messages that come from God and usually they come through animals. So I'm going to read a few poems. The first poem is called, What is a Grackle? Do we all know what a grackle is? It's a great bird. They used to be royal birds. Um, in the Mayan civilization, they prophesied. They were birds of prophecy. Now they live on the parking lots of uh, the Southwest, all the way up to Utah now. Um, they, and they have great calls, so that's all you need to know about this poem. What is a grackle? A comfort common to southwest desert parking lots, a familiar, a messenger, an overlooked angel oiled by asphalt, consolation of the casino, supermarket spiritual guide picking at a free today hot dog, a dropped grape or lentil, its purple-green head iridescent, its long keel of a tail. Black birds, but not blackbirds, with their showy epaulets blood red as a war field. Grackles glint like lacquered ebony, the females Brunhildas, if by Brunhilda you mean brown-headed, not the German ready for battle. Blind to centuries of borders, of battles, they waddle, stiff-legged at your feet, a janitorial sweep to their tails, checking cart tires and light poles for moths, beetles, singing their seven songs, slides, whistles, wheezes, catcalls, chirps, murmurs, clucks, to console you for your losses, stolen cars, mortgage payments spun to mist at a roulette table, the beloved who breathed fire and scorched your wedding clothes. Folly, wreckage, they mutter, down among the packs of backerboard and spackle. We've fallen from Mayan temples. In a past life, we prophesied. In a past life, we were gods. Um, and this is advice from the grackle. This is what the grackles have to tell us, the seven songs. After joy raises you into the stratosphere, ride Earth's colors as you wheel down. Fear backs you into a cave, only then do you cackle and hiss. Curse at a tornado and it might curse back. Why kick pebbles on your enemy? You will die without burying him. The ascent out of despair must be steady, slow, or your lungs will explode, your blood boil. Which is wisest, 
to endure hunger or waddle among wolves. Warn those you love when the predator approaches. Screech loudest when you are the predator. And the other way I've noticed that I invoke God is I invoke lesser gods <laughs> than, um, you know, like gods of my own making, well, or gods of the making of American culture. This uh, poem is called Americocentric Gods. Heretofore invisible, they don't reveal themselves in sense or smoke, don't vaporize within the curlicues of holy writ. They show up on a greyhound, then hustle, angle, smarm, minor deities raising themselves to glory, requiring homage. O oh, God of parking, you who have turned fickleness into metaphysics, won't you bless my husband and me with the least space at this $300 a ticket extravaganza? How have we sinned that you favor the Volvo and leave us to search clogged lots and garages to the periphery of the inhabited world? Tattoo God and beard God, I beg you, don't fight over my son. You have the Taliban, great bearded one, Hasidic Jews, ZZ Top, yea, even Lincoln. Holy tat, you've covered so much flesh, purple, orange, and green on Harley riders, scrolled blue-black NBA player bodies, not to mention haunch and boob, cheek and thigh of sexy starlets. If you must have my son, leave him to the other member of your trinity, god of time-wasting electronics. <laughs> Salad God, ding me in the back of the head with your garbanzo bean shooter each time I order a giant caramel chocolate shake, each time I raise a pork burrito to my lips. Teach me the joy of the edamame, ravish me with the redness of your holy tomato. Lint God, I fear your gathering power under the bed. God of static, don't shock me, I sacrifice synthetics. Bungee God, carry me off, spring me back. Tax God, reward my truthfulness. I bow before you all, gods whose name is Legion, who goad, prick, haggle, crack, who swell, who bide your time, who plan on fame and fatness going viral. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of tax gods, the first of the two poems I'm going to read comes from a recent trip to Italy, so I hope that makes that trip tax deductible. Okay. Our Lady of Murano. The sexton admits us right before closing. One of the most influential instances of 14th century Byzantine art. I announce as we hurry in, look carefully. She may be on the final. Compare the Annunciation of the Virgin at the Victoria and Albert. I have 11 Google Docs on her and a new PowerPoint presentation instead of all those slides. A mother in a womb of bright gold tiles, a bubble that will not burst. She is as slender as smoke or as my faith, powerful as her own. Look carefully. She is the final. I try to recite to myself the four principal characteristics of the Byzantine Paleologue revival, 1260 to 1450. The mantra of an unbeliever, the tiles that pave my mind, but cannot remember, or only broken fragments, as she rises above me in a sky of unbroken gold. This is no country for art historians. <laughs> Next one is called In Memoriam. Its dedication is for all the victims of autism, especially Adam R. And its epigraph, write it like disaster from Bishop. Starts out with a chunk from a news um, report from the AP. An autistic teenager who cannot speak has been missing for a week with no sign of the boy. AP 
10, 11, 13. Avanti, forward, enter, come in. Used to invite someone into a room. Italian 115, footnote. Introduction to Italian, lesson seven on page 666. Will this be on the final? Was this his final call to Avante? Did his school fail his final by not recalling, by not locking the door, by not checking before? Has he come in to hallelujahs or horrors? Has he come into his birthright, worn so wrong, wronged so long? Has he come into the kingdom of the Lord, welcomed by the one who owes him the peace that passeth understanding and speech, or welcomed by the other one who beckons, who whispers to the speechless, come in, come here, avanti, avanti. Do you reckon he came inside their lair to their luring, to their circle of hell? Did they come inside him? Is he still enduring? Does he still endure? Speak the unspeakable for the one who cannot speak here. Fear capital offenses. Why ta while tabloids capitalize in boldface on Avante's thin face and fortune tellers hiss their hunches about how to find Avante. Who is praying for Avante? Who is praying on Avante? But the lost and found department is out to lunch. Thank you. The first poem I'm going to read um, is a poem from my first book, Green Squall, and it's one of the only poems in that book that's actually addressed to, the, uh, to God. And the title is, And the Sunflower Weeps <clears throat> for the Sun, Its Flower. <coughs> Sorry, getting a cold. <clears throat> one. There's a hole in the garden. It is empty. I envy it. Emptiness, the only freedom there is in a fallen world. Two, Father Sunflower, forgive me. I have been so preoccupied with my backaches and my headaches, with my sore back and my headaches and my beat-skipping heart, I have ignored the subtle huzzah of the date palms and daisies, of the blue days and the date palms. Three, or don't forgive me, what do I care? I am tired of asking for forgiveness. I am tired of being frightened all the time. I want to run down the street impaling everything, screaming obscenities and flapping my arms. Forget the date palms. Forget the daisies. Four. As a man, I am a disappointment. I know that. Is it my fault I was born in shadow? Through the banyan trees, an entourage of slovenly blondes comes naked and begging. Five. My days fly from me as though from a murderer. Can you blame them? Behind us, the house is empty and quiet as light. What have I done, Father, that I should spend my life alone? My second book which, praise be to God, is now forthcoming, um, is, uh, is, um, it began as an elegy for my, my small F father, but as the book progressed, the small F father and the big F father began to get intertwined until by the end I couldn't talk about one without talking to the other. Um, so this is a poem called Excerpts from the Unabridged History of Rainfall. And there are some sections in here uh, after the German, they're entitled, and they are my translations of uh, various German poems that um, worked in this context. One's by Rilke, one's by Gunther Eich, and uh, one's by Georg Trockel. And there is a, I believe there is, 
Uh, there is a term here, laying heavy leather. It's, um, it's a fight term. It means to hit someone really hard. Excerpts from the Unabridged History of Rainfall. In dark rain and sharp rain, in this rain sharpened dark, in this dark sharpened by the sound of rain falling on the roof of the hospital, in blessed rain, in godless rain, in rain that lays its gray weight on the grass, in rain that passes through the branches of the aspen and the mountain ash, and of this drip-lit river makes a testament to heaven's lack of light. Your doctor, with his every room, a shadeless chandelierium, what is this dark but light unlamped to him? In the photograph, my father is running down Miami Beach, his feet kicking up fans of sand between the splayed legs of lithe, smiling University of Miami cheerleaders. The year is 1947. God has once again cast Satan from his heaven, and it is safe to turn one's face unto the sun. The palm fronds by sea breezes bent are black against the thunder-headed sky. The hull of every sailboat is white. At the edge of the beach, an empty bench, birds. After the German one. From the hedgerow is heard the call of the plover, as plaintive as it is strong. You think of St. Jerome. There is in this one voice such an intense loneliness, only a downpour could answer it. Forget about your bones. This wet gets in the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, that pilot light we're all so proud of, and makes you wish its sad, dim flame would just hiss out, the waterlogged fronds of the tin palms dripping, the gate swinging sodden on its hinge. After the German too, nothing will there be but rain. No roof and no dam will protect me from it. On the paths will be trampled springs green to muck. The gray sky collapsing like a lung. The thunder down its heavy leather lays and from the ruined garden by the lake a hazy murmuration lifts into the rain-lit air, blurs into the mists that swirl there, then settles in thin wing-swept breaths back into the maiden hair. After the German three. In the hospital, the suffering shriek. The night's bluish plumage buzzes the rain, glittering, thunders down upon the roofs. The street lights have come on. Soon, it will be dark enough to see them. Today, it rained so hard, Father, you could hear it, life's shortness of breath. When I lived in Italy, I used to go um, and sit in churches. And, of course, in Italy, you have your choice. Um, uh, but there is one, uh, St. Agnes in Agone, which is right in the Piazza Navona. And I would go there uh, long about um, sunset because the, the light that would pour in through these windows was the most gorgeous light I'd ever seen. And I was reading Donald Justice at the time, and, and, and Justice has this beautiful poem written in a, in a form that I very much admired, so I thought I would try to to write a poem uh, in which this light appeared uh, using his form. And this is what I come up with. A moral victory is still a defeat. It was late in the year and late in the day, and in St. Agnese in Agone, the light was not quite right. So late in the year, so late in the day, it should have been a watery amber dripping through those high dome windows. Instead, it was a smoldered orange, almost embered, and it rose from the floor in front of the altar, a kind of shimmer that made of Judy's holy family an inferior mirage. That rose someone left on the floor in front of the altar, was that where the light was coming from? 
Was it coming from those candles burning on the altar? No. The light was shining from the shrine, from the skull of the saint herself. No wonder it was winter, the weak sun shining everywhere but there. The world grown cold and growing dark. It was late in the year and late in the day, everywhere but there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, for this great opportunity. Um, I'll read four poems, the first two quite short, but I wanted to start with an epigraph because um, I think it explains my spiritual life quite accurately. It's by uh, Juan Ramon Jimenez. Nothing happens or has everything happened and we are standing now quietly in the new life. So this is a, a poem that demonstrates that principle. Late morning, salvage. And now a calico stray ankles along, begging me to pick her up and breathe her sacred groves. And now a ruby throat mistakes my striped shirt for Eden and tries to drink my bum shoulder. Ah, the pleasures of waiting like a peasant for the next life. I can almost hear the search party above dragging the lake, all curses and oars and grappling hooks, placing bets on how quickly I'll be found. To the Lord of Sleepy Places. Taste me, Lord, the way a generous vintner tastes a so-so wine. Swishing around his mouth, what sat on the shelf too long, but had good color. Spit out my faults, breathe in cool air to set my smoky bouquet. Never mind, Lord, that I might have filled the best crystal goblets or been lifted to toast an epic journey. Enough if you taste me in the back of your throat while humming a blues line in a graveyard, just after dusk, to the blurred gossip of fireflies. Tabernacle. How many minutes does it take a gut shot buck to helter skelter through scree and lose the hunter? How many days for turkey vultures to convert death into gliding? How many years till some schlub hiker like me stumbles upon the remains? There it lay, a tableau in bleached bone, flight and collapse converted into sleep. Hooves and vertebrae, laddered ribs. I touched till I felt time chewing me from the inside as it must have chewed this deer. I lay down and woke an hour later to smoke, fire across the lake, the afternoon turned apocalyptic by haze. I plucked sage, Flicked an ant from my shoe, swallowed ashy air, glassed the slow syntax of scrub oak giving way to power lines and cul-de-sacs till I found my house, relic of some former life. I rose to my feet then, placed my boot on that scoured skull and wrenched. One antler cracked free, then the next. Picking my way down, I felt like a messenger who knows not what thrumming truth he has tasted, what questions hang from his antlered hands. Wavery with sun, my house looked like an ark floating away before I could bow my head and climb on. And this last piece is uh, either a prose poem or flash nonfiction. I can't decide. It has uncertain parentage. Um, I don't know, it took place on a study abroad a couple years ago. My Lord of. My Lord of March in Madrid and a desultory stroll through Paseo Park. My Lord of buying sweet yams from a vendor and devouring them in their skins, even the burned parts. My Lord of green grass springy, so I throw myself down. 
my lord of my daughter reading Jules Verne of all authors beside me, my lord of a single feather on the grass, which I send aloft, a numinous novel of the air, my lord of Picasso's Guernica in the Reina Sofia Museum, four blocks from here, my lord of the wall opposite the painting turning blue every six months, a mystery like statues weeping, my lord of the mystery salt, visitors sliding their jeans against the wall to get a wider perspective on fire raining down on hooved animals and the peasants who feed them. My lord of three million glorious bodies in this city, but all I need is my beloved. Until she arrives, my lord of impatient waiting, and after, my lord of hugging her like a lost lover, just a few layers of decorum between her electric skin and mine. My lord of a bike thrown down in sand like a gored horse, of cigarette smoke rising ragged and holy. My lord of who feeds these feral cats slinking, and where do all the feathers of the world end up? My lord of my achy leg growing achier on account of my daughter leaning. My lord of 14 years ago, she didn't exist on this planet, neither 20,000 leagues below or above. My lord of right now, and not yesterday, and maybe not tomorrow. Therefore, let her lean. My lord of sun and desire, of green and again green, of feathers I can't see, floating like petitions borne by the breeze. My lord of here I am, where are you? My lord of thank you, my lord of my endless lord. Thank you. Fancy curtains back there. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Yeah, we're gonna make it. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I've actually never been to this campus, um, and uh, when I first moved to Utah, I don't, I don't truthfully know that I would have made it through my first winter here had I not encountered the kindness of, of Kim Johnson. So, um, I'm honored. I'm going to start, I'm going to read four short poems, but I'm going to start with one uh, by Mark Jarman because uh, his absence allowed me to be here today. Unholy Sonnet 11. Half asleep in prayer, I said the right thing and felt a sudden pleasure come into the room or my own body in the dark, charged with a, char with a change of atmosphere. At first, I couldn't tell my body from the room and I was wide awake full of this feeling, alert as though I'd heard a doorknob twist, a drawer pulled, and instead of terror, knew the intrusion of an overwhelming joy. I had said thanks, and this was the response. But how I said it, or what I said it for, I still cannot recall. And I have tried all sorts of ways, all hours of the night. Once was enough to be dissatisfied. Him to a landlocked God. Perhaps as a child, you too saw these stallion clouds and knew a sky with no blue was a sky too reverent to be overlooked or understood. Perhaps heaven is the moon flag, not the moon. And you came to know praise as vertical only because the earth refused your reach. Look up, is a tear in the sky tonight like the shriek of a frightened mare or the long wail a saxophone makes on a corner at dawn, and this is how I know you are a woman. We are both broken in two by our own creations. I have looked to the west in search of water, and the sheer faces of so many boulders stare back, their bodies bent in genuflection at the altar of the sky. Why have you made me know the sea? Make me a bird, Lord. Make me a man. Make me a barn with a spine so swayed it pulls back my neck to crane toward the sky. Huzzle for finally leaving what has already left. I imagine there were angels once, or at least the sound of them, 
trumpeting some broken hallelujah against the ceiling above that bed. There must have been electricity, a current, to power the elaborate maneuvering that kept me fastened to that bed. I don't remember much. The arrivals and departures blurred as healing scars and the kitchen always quiet. There was little concern for bedlam or bedtime. In the mornings, it snowed, kept me close to the windows, screams thawing like my want, wired and damp. At night, a phantom weight beside me in the bed. I imagine spring could have begun kindly and coaxed the steady stride of summer into its measured snare, an, an entire season of sickness, bedbound alone with the book of hours, then swung hard into September, pocket watches leaned open in palms like old men in gold rockers, beds like deep yawns, yawns like gaping coffins. Lord, what was I but made in your image, invisible? I come to you a cavern of bedrock, rendered acquiescent. I arrive secondhand. You, Lord, are the woman I long to be or be with, the walking ache of so many confessions, the merciful repository embedded in surrender, come, weep in my arms. If you are the beginning and end, then let us be what we are best. The slow departure, the unlikely subsistence, bedmates without a bed. Do we have time for two more? Yes. Maybe one long. Last psalm at sea level. Sorrow, I have no way to go. We meet at dawn. Your face, always the ceiling. Your body, its own beast wedged between us. Hooves against my chest. Their weight, a violent kiss made gentle by the gravity of sleep until the sun rises or doesn't. A thousand miles from here, there is a 4,300 foot drop to the forgotten syllable of her name that sometimes surfaces at night like a buoy in my mouth and bobs through the jetsam of homesickness that pollutes even my dreams. She is a lighthouse, and I do not wish to be, be the sea. Sorrow, I have cried out my own name without Californias for so long it might as well have been a prayer. Sorrow, I bury my woman heart in the hard bed of this valley and let it sleep like the fish frozen among the boulders in the Provo River, or the memory of a childhood desire to be a boy on a horse with a rifle of his own, sorrow. I will follow your hoofprints anywhere, but to the shoreline that made me a tide pool instead of solid stone. I wish instead for a field of corn. I wish for a season that does not begin with the quick tides of ache. I wish for a compass that leads me like a horse to water but leaves me at the edge of an unfenced field and I wish the God of this place would come down from the roof and wake me herself. Thank you. Thank you.